Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Welcome to Looking at the Markets with David Modell. Today's special guest is Miss Lynette Zhang, a popular financial YouTuber, as well as the Chief Market Analyst at ITM Trading, covering a wide range of topics, including price action, bonds, yield curve, precious metals, and hedging. Thank you, Miss Zhang, for joining me today on Looking at the Markets. It's my pleasure to be here, David. It's a lot of fun doing this. Well, I, I really appreciate it. And you just came off an intense Greg Hunter interview, so I think this may be a little more relaxing for you, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have fun with that, too. I Absolutely. Yeah, 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 no, he's great. Um, so let's start at the beginning, if that's okay. How did you first get involved in finance and specifically in the commodities markets? Oh, okay. That is an interesting question. Actually, I started when I was 10 because my uncle was a major dealer back east and he dealt in high-end antiques and in gold. So he was my favorite uncle. I spent a lot of time with him. He would give me books as I was growing up for my birthday and he really taught me what it looks like in the physical market and, and plus what really made an impression on me. And it's so interesting because you never really realize this until you have some hindsight. I remember going over to his house with my parents and he had these safes in this back room and he'd open them up and you couldn't even fit one more gold coin in there. And that was uh, 1964 wow. when it was illegal to hold more than five ounces of gold. And he told my parents, if anything should happen to me, Aunt Bertie is well taken care of for the rest of her life because of this gold. So that made, I wish it actually made a bigger impression on me and I really understood it more, but I was 10 at the time. So that's actually what started that. And then my father was, uh, it was a small town. I was raised in Kingston, New York, and he was kind of a bigger fish in a little town and he was a developer. So I actually started in commercial banking when I was 15, studied business finance, went to state in commercial banking till 86, then went over and became a stockbroker with Shearson in, uh, in 86. And in that capacity, uh, I would say that I'm, I know people refer to gold and silver as commodities, and they're certainly a part of their intrinsic value that are commodities. But my studies really are around money. Sure. And I started that in 87 is when I started studying currencies and money. That's when I discovered they have a life cycle. And here we are. You know, I came here in 2002, built all the databases to track everything. But I was always attracted to understanding this. So, yeah, what a foundation oh. to have. And some, inter oh. some interesting characters in your, in your backstory there, <laughs> to say the least. That's a great story. <laughs> to go to, but I can get as detailed as you want. Sure, sure. Now, uh, let's get into precious metals. How could we not? Uh, I've heard yeah. you reference a reset to $8,900 yes. an ounce for gold and $600 an ounce for silver. How yes. do the concepts of nominal confusion and perception yeah. management impact the way we value these precious metals? I am so glad you asked me that question <laughs> right? because, you know, understand that the primary function of money to begin with, they needed a tool to hold your wealth and your, your work, your labor, even over time. So for example, if I'm a farmer, which I am these days, and I grow this huge field of corn and I spend a lot of time and energy there, well, if, I, if my family and I consume all that we can and there's nothing we need from a neighbor, then I needed a way if I had more crops in the field to, I didn't want it just to go to waste, so I needed a way to hold it until down the road when I needed it. So many, many things have been tried over the years, but only gold actually meets every criteria to be a good money, and it is labor-based. So it takes labor to pull gold out of the ground, and it was a very fair way to value labor for labor. 
but for the government, they wanted to tax and spend more. So holding your wealth even was really not on their agenda. So in this case, in 1913, they legalized the Federal Reserve and we began the transition from a good money, savings-based, labor-based standard to a fiat. Now, fiat actually means by decree. So this is legalized government money. And its most important function is inflation, which guarantees that you can't buy the same amount of goods for the same amount of, of money in the future. Right. Now, since that's the, the primary premise, there were two, area, two entities that really benefited by it. For the government, they allowed an inflation tax on your work and your wealth. And even if nominally, and I'll come to that in a second, but even if nominally your salary went up, then they get to tax you more on that inflation. And you cooperate because you don't understand inflation. That's the nominal confusion part. So for governments, it was great, they got to tax you more and you cooperated. For corporations, they actually wanted you to work for less. But they knew if you were willing, if you were used to getting 10 bucks an hour, you weren't gonna work for five. However, if they could still give you that 10 bucks, but it only spent like five, then they've accomplished that goal. So today we have this huge shift in, in income inequality because everybody knows that salaries never keep pace, the average salaries anyway, never keep pace with inflation. Sure. So why don't we realize this, okay? Because nominally, if you had a $20 bill 20 years ago and you have it today, nominally they're exactly the same. They're mm -hmm. both $20, but the underlying value and what you can buy with it, as you can see, is vastly different. Yeah. And, and we've all experienced it. And that's nominal confusion. So the stock market going up as the dollar value declines is nominal confusion. Wow. Those stocks and your holdings must rise faster than the real decline in purchasing power or you're behind the eight ball. Yeah. You see what I mean? Sure, sure. I love a prepared guest. That is wonderful. <laughs> and those charts really put it into perspective, just like you, you do in your YouTube videos. You've got plenty yes. of visuals there. And that really, as, as an educator myself, that really drives the point home. We saw the three baskets there, uh, you know, that used to be full of groceries. And now, now you're uh, feeling a little hungry <laughs> in 2017. Exactly. And who doesn't know that? Right? We all know that. We live it every day. Yeah. And yet it continues, and yet we continue to put up with it for various reasons. Yeah. All right. Until yep. at some point, there's nothing left. And that's why I said that we are near the end of the cycle. Yeah. Because officially, this is from the Federal Reserve. It's one of my favorite websites, Fred. Right. So anybody can go in and use it. But officially, there's four cents worth of purchasing power left in the dollar. So even assuming that that's accurate and they haven't fudged those numbers, the problem that they're having is going below zero, right? The yeah. negative interest rates. That's why they don't like cash. That's why you see this global war on cash, because there's simply not much purchasing power left in any of the currencies. I'm not saying they can't continue to inflate it right. as long as people have confidence sure they can make that basket of groceries you know go up and up and up and up and up and then say look at how well our gdp is doing mm -hmm. but there's a problem if you're if your income is not keeping pace with that which it's designed not to yeah so wanted to talk about uh, some etfs you know i am so tempted today <laughs> with slv the silver etf very popular very liquid plenty of volume <laughs> and it's heading toward 15 which was a buy price that i was looking at maybe, maybe sell some 15 strike puts i don't know uh, gld another popular etf this one represents gold is heading toward 116 per share um, somehow I get the feeling that you might not be as trusting of these ETFs as I am. <laughs> What's your take on that? 
well, I think I'm older than you, so anybody <laughs> that's, I'm 62, okay. so anybody that's been around for a while has probably experienced without realizing it the dematerialization of all of the markets. And certainly gold and silver are no different. So looking at SLV, this is a trust. If you own or you choose, well, you never really own anything if it's held in an account anyway, but if you think you own SLV, all you really own are shares of a trust that is designed to mimic the managed manipulated spot price. Right. What people don't see is this. Now, what this is, is a relative performance chart, uh, spot silver against SLV. And okay. you can see that these lines are overlapping. Okay. And then that starts to shift. Can you see that? And now yeah. there's a gap. Right. Okay. So what that actually is showing you is they sell off their holdings to pay those fees. So you think you're buying silver, number one, you're buying a share in the trust, and number two, it's a diminishing asset because they are constantly selling off their holdings to pay those fees. Right. And it's the same thing is true with GLD. They avoid those fees in the beginning, and it's in the, it's all in the prospectus, so you can read it for yourself, sure. so you can see how it overlaps, but look at this over time, that all it's doing is mimicking that price, it is losing value. Mm. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. If it's held inside of a brokerage account, it's held in street name, and you are simply the beneficial owner but they've taught us that paper's good. Look at how liquid it is because they make a market until they don't make a market, okay? That's why you think it looks liquid because at the moment they happen to be supporting that market. So if it's a short-term trade that you're looking for, if that's kind of your mentality, then it is a cheaper way to do that trade for a short period of time because it will mimic spot. But if you think that you actually own something that's going to protect you, forget about it. It's all manipulated. And it's just about the fees. And the guys that can actually convert those shares into real gold and silver that they presumably, and, and I'm sure they do, hold in the vault is not you. It's JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or any of the big kahunas. It's not you. And that's what people really need to understand in this environment. So we can predict or project in the future that these ETFs will do a poorer and poorer job of tracking the actual spot price of the precious metal. Yeah, and as we can see in the chart. It, 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 you're right. It can, it can continue to uh, track the manipulated spot price. It's just over time you're paying more for less and less value. Yeah, yeah. In addition, it's just a trust. So it, it'll probably continue to mimic it because that's what they need you to do so that you feel like you actually own something. Right. But don't. Yeah. Huh. Something to think about. Something for me to think about for sure. I uh, wanted to talk about uh, I, itmtrading.com. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, people should check out itmtrading.com. The link will be in the description of this YouTube video. What services are currently being offered at ITM Trading? Well, we're a full service physical precious metals brokerage house. So anything that you do with us, we will deliver out to you. We are not going to store it. And while that might temporarily for some people, they go, oh my God, I, I, I have to deal with this physical metal. Well, I got news for you. I would much rather have the physical metal in my possession that I can then choose to protect right. in any way that I'm comfortable with then give it to the foxes that are already guarding this hen house. So everything we do here is physical. But really what makes us different is our team and our knowledge base. Since I've studied currency since 87, then I, I do consider myself an artist and what I see are patterns. So over the years, I've developed a strategy first for myself based upon those repeatable patterns in both movement and valuation. And we talked about the fundamental value. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Yeah. But 
um, our approach is very consultative. So we want to know who you are, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, all of your goals, all of your circumstance, what your fixed rate debt is, property, everything. We want to really understand you so that the portfolio that we build for you actually supports what you're trying to accomplish. And I don't know, I'm not saying nobody else does that, I just don't personally know of anybody else that takes that approach. Right. And, and then beyond that, once you are a client of ours, we actually have a personal booklet based upon your goals, your circumstance, and what you've chosen to do so that if, God forbid, this is not what the intention is, but who knows what's going to happen with the grid or what have you, you will actually have your own personal booklet so that if you can't get a hold of us, you know how to walk through. Yeah. Plus, you've seen the webinars on our YouTube channel. You know, it's ongoing education. It's, it's constantly uh, keeping you abreast of where we are in this trend cycle. And when you see this, what does it really mean for what's happening underneath? Yeah. So that's all of that is how we function. Keen on education. We love educated clients and we help you execute that strategy. I can see that. I'm looking <laughs> looking at the website right now. I see you can get a free gold kit just for entering your basic mm -hmm. information there. That's free. Uh, you've got webinars. These are free. Uh, you serve people with IRAs, I see there. Um, and you've got some beautiful pictures of gold bullion, silver coins, um, you know, all, all kinds of cool stuff here. Featured products, specials. Um, it's it's fantastic. So what a bet, what better way is there to get the physical stuff so you don't have to worry about tracking errors and everything we're learning about today. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, the beauty part, too, you know, I've been here since 2002, and pretty much everybody has been here for a really long time. And we're a really cohesive team, and everybody pays attention. So you may be sitting here and listening to me, but my bet is, is if you call up and you talk to one of our team members, you're going to hear a very similar voice. Right. And that's, you know, that's something else because, you know, this is not a regulated industry other than money laundering part. So the person that you're dealing with could have been selling shoes yesterday. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting perspectives. Um, in a couple of recent interviews with Cliff High and Daniel Amaduri, I've been told in no uncertain terms that the U.S. dollar will be worthless within our lifetime. Do you agree with this? What do you think? <laughs> so the problem is, is that in the current monetary system, the money is created from debt. But we hit peak debt in 97, and you can see that. And what that means is, uh, like, if, if let's say I, you just get out of college and you're living with your parents so you have no debt and you have no responsibilities but you get your first job so you decide that you want to go buy a car but you don't want to save up all the money for it just the down payment so you go and you take on debt you're promising to pay it back tomorrow but you're spending those dollars today so yes taking on debt would be stimulative to your economy Okay, and so you can see on this graph that it was stimulative. I mean, here's 1970 when we started this path, and you can and these uh, vertical gray bars are official recessions. So you can see that in '97 we hit peak debt, where the debt would stimulate the economy. We've certainly grown a whole lot more debt since then, but it hasn't done it. Now, this to me is the most important chart because when we see, like this was cash for clunkers, that little blip up, right. when we see this going up in a pervasive way more than just a little blip, then that is most likely to be telling you that hyperinflation is here. Yeah. Okay? Because people don't hold on to dollars. Right now, they're holding on to it. They're not spending. This is worse than it was during the Depression in 33, according to the Federal Reserve. Mm. And you can see, does that look like it's stimulated? Mm. Not but so how much. much debt yeah. has, right. But how much debt have we grown? You know, a tremendous amount. Trillions and trillions and all the leverage. 
So this is when they really started levering out the system. So, you know, that that's why, yeah, in our lifetime, oh, probably within within five years, I think we'll see the reset. I could be wrong. That's not something I have control of. But, you know, how long can they keep doing this? As long as there's confidence. Yeah, yeah. Kind of scary, but this is a wake-up call that I think we need. Um as far as people yeah. people who are considering getting into equities now, well, let, let me phrase it this way, if I may. Um, hypothetically speaking, if your elderly grandparents told you that they were going to invest 60% of their life savings into the S&P 500, maybe SPY, the ETF, and the other 40% in TLT, the bond ETF, a very popular strategy recommended by lots of investment advisors, what would you say to them? No! <laughs> you know, I, I have a funny story because uh, my mom passed like five years ago. Well, wow, 2010, so more than five years ago. But obviously as a stockbroker and then I managed her portfolio, but she had her head up until the day that she died. So you were not telling Lillian Zhang anything that, you know, she didn't want to do. Right. In July of 2009, the dollar against the weighted basket of currencies fell to its lowest level ever. Now look, I, I didn't know how this was going to unfold, but whenever you see a shift in the pattern, it means something. And seeing the dollar fall to its lowest level, frankly, freaked me out. So um, I recommended to my mom that she shift a lot of what she had in the market. In fact, I told her to get out. Well, she didn't listen to me, and that's okay. That was in July. In February, she said, Lynn, would you please look at my statement? Because something's got to be wrong with it. And she lost like 20000 bucks between July and February. And of course, when I looked at it, well, well, what happened after 2007? The whole system started visibly falling apart in March with Bear Stearns going out. And then by the following September, well, that's when Lehman went down. We had the Lehman moment and everything crashed. So even between July and, and February, the shift, well, the shift, that wasn't the first shift, but that was a significant shift. So if anybody wanted to invest in the second most expensive stock market in history or hold their wealth there, were the most expensive bond market in history, then I'd say you must really like the banks because you're going to give it to them. Hmm. You're not going to have it. The lesson I just gained from that is we need to listen to Miss Lynette Zhang the first time she tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can't control anything, but truthfully, you, you, any time there is a shift in normal behavior, even going back, take any one of these graphs, right? right? Normal behavior when they put debt in was that it would be stimulative to the economy. Yeah. Well, guess what? Do you see? Is that what you see happening here? Mm. And what about here? And they keep telling you there's a recovery, right? Mm. So it isn't really me saying it. You just need to. Um, learn how to pay attention a little bit differently. Yeah. That's what I try and teach you in all of my, you know, our YouTube channel with all the charts and the graphs. Yeah. You know, can you see the pattern? Can you see the shift? Yeah. Because if I can help you fish, right, versus right. fish for you, mm -hmm. now you can make independent, educated choices, regardless of what anybody right. says, especially financial advisors. Right. Remember, I was one. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um, know what they do. Right. Yeah, people need to, if they haven't already, I don't know who hasn't already, but they need to check out your YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, go to that little search box there, type in Lynette Zhang and see all of the videos that, that you put out a lot of content and it's consistently high in quality. Uh, you have not sacrificed quality for quantity or vice versa. So that's, I think that's great. I work all 
the time. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> I work all the time. Yeah, yeah, and it's for the benefit of, of your clients and, as well as your, your viewers and listeners. Um, yes. Now, I wanted to get onto a hot topic, if I may, cryptocurrencies. I, I get emails about that on a daily basis. I'll bet you do too, probably, right about now. Um, mm -hmm. so that seems to happen whenever something goes up 1,000%, 5,000%. Suddenly, there's a, a spike in interest. Imagine that. <laughs> um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Are you bullish on these? What's your take? Well, okay. Here's my take on it. First of all, I am 100% convinced that that's the direction of the new money standard. Because once it's in the system, then they have you completely. They can dictate everything. Yeah. So um, I have a few uh, feelings around this. But one thing that I'd like to bring out is that typically for a central bank, when they make a policy decision, there's a lag time of whether they or not they know it was effective of 18 months. If everything is in crypto, then they can push a button and have immediate impact. So if they want you to visibly see that your principal is going down, and they say this in their uh, cashless society piece that they did, I did a webinar on that, yeah. but they say that once, once we get rid of cash, there are no limits to how low we can push interest. In other words, since they have, you know, once they've used up all the principal, now they got, or rather the purchasing power, now they need to attack principal, which is what those negative rates are about. Yeah. So the governments have taken, the CFTC and, and globally uh, have taken a hands-off approach to the development of this article, of this um, area, because as you so rightly pointed out, when something moves up a thousand percent or a thousand dollars or whatever, people notice. Yeah. And since we have been trained to feel comfortable with intangibles inside of the system that is not controlled by us, the higher they go, the more people try to participate and do participate. But at the end of the day, you know, Central banks are not going to give up their money monopoly easily, sure. in my opinion, and according to everything that I've read. And so while it seems decentralized at the moment, because that's the way they want you to think about it, perception management, okay, and also the nominal confusion because yep. people marry the legal money of the state, there will come a point in here when they have that technology and those smart contracts all dialed in where there will be a major crisis and people will look to be saved. Right. And so that's when they have you. And my bet is, and I could certainly be wrong about this, not within my control, but the, the uh, cryptocurrency that's named the SDR coin, which is controlled by the IMF, will not be decentralized and neither will all of your information will be in one central location and they push a button immediate impact how yeah. handy hmm interesting oh. yeah it's, uh, it's giving me a lot to think about right now and oh. finally given the anemic gdp growth but nonetheless we have an equities market that refuses to pull back more than a handful of percentage points can mm -hmm. we reasonably expect a large drawdown in the near future, or is VIX below 13 the new normal? What do you think? Well, all of these markets are absolutely and totally controlled. Here you go, all of the central bank, global central bank money printing. Yeah. So this is why you see the markets up at nosebleed levels. Now, the reason why you do not see them having the ability to pull back, so they've got to keep injecting cash to keep them supported, are all of the derivative bets that are underneath that. It's not real. I know the stock market in nominal terms and bond market have gone up in nominal terms, which means, you know, it just looks like they've gone up. Right. But the real growth in these markets since 97, since 96, has been the growth of derivatives. All of that leverage, that's the real, that's where the real growth has come from. And their price action is based upon the price action of the underlying 
whatever it's attached to. So it could be stocks or bonds or real estate or other derivatives. So if that crypto, if that technology, the blockchain technology with a smart contract, once that is fully functional at the speed and the way that they need it to be, that's when they'll need a big crisis. And according to the IMF, Deutsche Bank is systemically the most dangerous bank on the planet, completely globally interconnected. Well, their leverage is like 29 to 1 according to the financial statement. So they can't afford a 4% drop or they are officially insolvent. All the derivatives make them insolvent anyway, but officially they're insolvent. So that's why you see that extraordinarily tight range. Um, it would be a black swan event, maybe North Korea, maybe, you know, something we're not anticipating yeah. that would take it out of their control. But as long as it's in their control, I don't think they're uh, wanting the derivative market to implode. So it'll stay in a narrow range. Yeah. So I, I'm not asking you to be a top caller, but is there a time frame in which we might anticipate? Uh, again, the reason it's called a, a black swan or a catalyst is because we don't know it's coming. But, uh, you know, I, out of all the people I've interviewed, uh, yeah, there, there it is. There it is. <laughs> there it is. For this and for so many reasons. Yeah. This is the volatility on the 10-year treasury, which is the base of every market. Right. Well, you know, here you go. This is when it was only marginally managed because the Federal Reserve has actually been buying treasuries since 2002. So we already started going down then. But you can see the dashes. It was not a volatile market. Right. Once 2008 hit, we went on life support. The, the system actually died. Yeah. And every single tool that the central bankers had up until that moment, all scrapped. Everything is new and experimental. And I even did a web webinar on all of their new experiments, paying interest, doing all sorts of negative rates, you know, all of that stuff. So this is 2013, which is when they really started manipulating the uh, price. Of, well, they actually started 2011 in here yeah. to manipulate the price of gold hard, hard, because it almost broke through 2000. So. The question is, how long can they, can you live if this is an EKG? How right. long can this go on? <laughs> I, I will be surprised, yeah. although I've been surprised, honestly, if they can hold it together through the end of the year. Yeah. It's just rigid. I mean, there's no give in these markets. Just right. too rigid. It seems like nothing surprises me anymore, but, uh, you know, we, we have to be careful in today's environment, in today's manipulated environment, in today's unstable and richly valuated, to put it charitably, uh, equities markets. And so we have to look elsewhere. And uh, of all the people I've interviewed, um, I, I knew that you'd have not only an answer for me, but a chart. <laughs> and I think <laughs> well, it's wonderful. I, think. I, I You know, I think people, everybody learns a little bit differently. Yeah. I learned that from uh, from a teacher, one of my daughters, when she was in sixth grade. And, you know, that way, if I do it visibly and verbally, it just makes a whole lot more sense. It's easier to grasp because these things are made intentionally. I mean, they say this. If we make it really complicated, nobody questions us. Oh, you know, I mean, these guys are so smart. I can't understand that. Yes, you can. Everybody can. Yeah. So that's my mission. ITMtrading.com, solid as gold, ITM, Better Business Bureau accredited, 20 years old at least, and still going strongly. Uh, full service precious metals firm specializing in gold and silver products, ranging from bullion to rare gold coins. Plenty of free uh, resources on the website as well, and also get your free gold kit on there. Why, why, why isn't everybody doing this right now? 888 Six nine six four six five three or itmtrading.com. Miss Lynette Zhang, how can people contact you either on social media or elsewhere? Well, if you bear with me, uh, I'm not really tweeting yet, but I, I know that's on my agenda. I just have to, you know, take the time uh, to prioritize it. But you can always contact us at that phone number. I mean, we're all here. We're all working together. You, you can you can call me, but where you 
where you hear the hesitancy is I haven't yet figured out how to make a 48 hour day. <laughs> so, but well, there's a bunch of us here, there's 25 of us here and we're all really smart and we all take the time and we all pay attention. Yeah. So, you know, if you really need me, I'm here for you. I'll keep doing my work, but um, there's lots of great people here. Yeah. Yeah. And I've experienced that I'm personally. Proud of them. Yeah. Right. I'm very proud of them. They are, they are fantastic. Miss Lynette Zhang, thank you so much for joining me today on look, Looking at the Markets. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.